No, you were here. <clears throat> After yesterday. <laughs> Not a terrible thing in my view. No, just kidding. Um, yes, I spent a lot of time yelling as well at the TV yesterday. Anyway, uh, welcome to the State Department uh, Monday morning briefing, Monday morning, Monday afternoon briefing. Um, yes, it does. <laughs> Uh, uh, just a couple of things at the top, and then I'll open it up to your questions. Uh, first, I wanted to briefly uh, talk a little bit about Secretary Kerry's uh, trip today to uh, Colombia. He's in Cartagena, Colombia, leading the United States delegation at the signing of the final peace accord between the government of Colombia and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, uh, the FARC, to end over 50 years of conflict, this hemisphere's longest war. Our Peace Columbia strategy, announced by President Obama in February, uh, will support uh, implementation uh, of the uh, accord uh, with a focus on, its, on three pillars. Uh, first, security, including counter-narcotics and reintegration of former fighters. Uh, second, expanding state presence in public institutions. And then thirdly, uh, justice and other assistance for the victims of this conflict. U.S. support for Colombia has been a bar bipartisan effort uh, sustained across more than three presidential administrations, proving that a resilient long-term partnership with a committed nation does pay real dividends. So congratulations. I uh, also wanted to mention uh, briefly the United States uh, this, uh, hosting the uh, 2016 Africa Growth and Opportunity Act Forum, so-called GOA, uh, for those of you into acronyms. This morning, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs Linda Thomas-Greenfield and U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman uh, welcomed more than 400 participants to the 2016 AGOA Forum. The annual AGOA Forum serves as the premier event that brings together African trade ministers with U.S. counterparts to discuss how we can work together to enhance our trade and investment relationship. Earlier today, the State Department hosted the first AGOA Dialogue on Women in Trade. Uh, the discussion explored how to realize uh, the inclusion of women entrepreneurs in political and economic sphere uh, as called for in the reauthorized AGOA. Now, there is a growing consensus in both Africa and the United States that open trade and international investment are among the fastest ways for Africa to boost its economic growth, uh, spur development, and reduce poverty. Since 2000, uh, GOA has been the cornerstone of U.S. economic policy in Africa. And the recent 10-year extension of AGOA pro provides uh, an important degree of predictability to investors and buyers who are looking to invest in or source from Africa and will, keep, and will help keep our trading relationship with Sub-Saharan Africa on a positive track. However, it is also important for U.S. and African policymakers to begin drawing up a strategy appropriate for the next phase in our trading relationship. That's all I have. Matt, over to you. Um. Well, I wasn't going to start with this, but what, what is the next phase? In the well, I think it's, under, it's, it's all under discussion, but uh, um, uh, I think looking at how to kind of take this, take the trade relationship to the next level. So supporting entrepreneurs, but also strengthening those uh, right, trading ties. Right, extended for 10 years. Then. Well, I know. It's a long-term strategy. I understand right. that. But okay. um, on uh, the secretary. Uh, I, I haven't seen all of his comments that he made today, but I, know, I did see some brief ones about the situation in Syria. And I don't – I apologize if, I, if he said more and I missed it, but uh, wh what is the status of your consultations with the Russians right now? Is that, is that still happening? Has he spoken with Lavrov? Are, the, are these people meeting in Geneva still, or is it just – done? Is it – I don't want to say it's done, but but there's been nothing to report on. Uh, I think since Friday, uh, I'm just checking quickly, but I, I don't believe he's spoken with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, <clears throat> since Friday. So, what, so what? what what's the status? Well, of look, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you see, saw what the secretary said. It's hard to. Um, it's hard to uh, point to a cessation uh, of hostilities. It's hard to uh, point to a diplomatic process when uh, we're in the midst of uh, a pretty aggressive, aggressive uh, uh, series of assaults on Aleppo. Um, I don't want to say we've thrown in the towel, and I don't think he would say that, but 
it's hard unless we see some uh, gestures by uh, Russia on behalf of the regime or the regime in Russia, um, significant gestures. And we talked some about some of those in New York last week. Uh, you know, we're not, this isn't, we don't see this moving forward, but we're still committed to pursuing this process. It's just, we're not in a good place. I don't know how to put it well, more frankly than that. <laughs> well, I mean, cl clearly not. Yeah. I mean, co but ac according to you guys, uh, you're looking for gestures for that. But aren't you seeing gestures from the Russians and from the Assad regime right now? Well, uh, arguably, yes. I mean, that's true. So, I mean, I, you know, the Secretary said, so uh, why haven't you said it's unacceptable. Well, Matt, I mean, you know, this is, uh, and I think the Secretary has uh, talked about this and certainly talked about it at the end of last week uh, when it was clear that uh, he and everyone was pretty frustrated by the lack of progress. But, you know, um, we're still committed to pursuing a diplomatic process because, First of all, uh, it's really the only way out of this, it's the only viable way out of the, the, the mess that is Syria. But secondly, um, you know, I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, he put it as diplomatic, it would be diplomatic malpractice uh, to not pursue this, that he's, it's incumbent on him as the Secretary of State uh, to pursue this to the last possible measure. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. But you, so you don't think that the last possible measure has been reached now? We don't, but we're getting close. Um, and uh, it's, as I said, it's hard. And the Secretary said earlier today in, uh, in Cartagena that, you know, what's happening in Aleppo is unacceptable. Um, you know, and it's hard to talk about any kind of uh, uh, transition government or any kind of negotiating process when, you know, uh, the moderate Syrian opposition and civilians in Aleppo are being bombed. Clearly, the regime and quite possibly Russia believe that there's still a military solution here, and that's that's difficult to, to you know, it's difficult to pursue a diplomatic uh, process when you've got that the scenario. Secretary himself Please. said in those comments um, to the reporters traveling with him that uh, Syria and Russia uh, appear to be pursuing a military solution and to be trying to take Aleppo uh, and destroying it in the process. Um, is the United States willing to do anything to try to stop Sy Syrian and Russian forces from taking Aleppo? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by willing to do anything. A military solution. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to do anything besides verbally asking them to stop, which doesn't seem to have worked, to stop them? Well, um, look, we're committed to continuing to engage with Russia uh, diplomatically, and we're not going to walk away from that avenue. Um, again, the Secretary said it would be diplomatic malpractice to do so. As dark as it seems, frankly, it's it's one of the few options that we have. Um, you know, I mean, if you're asking about, you know, the the legendary Plan B, uh, I think that we're not there yet. Um, and frankly, we continue to have all of these discussions within the interagency about uh, what other options we do have. And that conversation, that dialogue continues. But um, we still believe that based on the agreement that we reached in Geneva with Russia, that that dap diplomatic process is is still the best uh, option we have. But you haven't suggested any willingness to do anything besides focus on a diplomatic option that clearly well, failed at least last week in its latest iteration, not to mention all the previous ones, yeah. failed most recently. So. I'm just asking, is there yeah. anything else that you're willing to do beyond talking and pursuing a diplomatic option? Well, again, I mean, you know, we can all extrapolate on what the other options are out there, but, uh, you know, where we are at uh, with our Syria policy right now is a diplomatic process and pursuing through the ISSG and through direct uh, dialogue with Russia uh, a way forward that tries to 
bring some credibility back to the process. You can't have that, obviously, today with the, the firefighting or the assaults on, the, on the Aleppo. But what the Secretary talked the last week about in New York, which is, you know, uh, a, 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 frankly, an extraordinary gesture on the part of Russia and Russia influencing the regime to, for example, ground these aircraft in some ways to jumpstart what would be a credible way forward uh, for a cessation of hostilities. Now, I'm not deluded. We're not there. We're not. We're far from there. Uh, and it's hard to keep that in perspective as we are presented with the facts on the ground today. But that is the option that we continue to pursue. The, the sec one, one more for me, yeah, if sure. I may. The Secretary also said on Friday that he had had a brief – well, he didn't say it was brief, but he said he had talked to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and that they had made a little progress. Foreign Minister Lavrov was asked on Friday afternoon what that progress was. And he he didn't say there was no progress, but he said nothing to suggest that there was any progress. So what was the progress that ha that you made on Friday afternoon – on Friday morning, excuse me, when they spoke briefly? Um, and why haven't you had any conversation since then? Well, I mean, uh, I, I think we're looking to see um, – uh, I'm not sure specifically what he was alluding to by uh, the progress. Um, we talked about some of the, uh, as I said, some of the measures we wanted to see uh, Russia and the regime take, uh, again, to restore credibility to this process. I also think that, um, uh, you know, the ball is somewhat in Russia's court now, uh, where we want to see some kind of action that we believe can uh, – prove that there's still legitimacy to this process. And I think that's what we're – one of the reasons why we haven't had continued conversations, because we haven't seen that yet. But the fact that uh, today Mr. Lavrov said that uh, he did not consider the process dead, you don't consider it dead, isn't that uh, – doesn't that suggest that you, and, we might have a meeting and sometime soon, maybe today, maybe tomorrow? I, I, again, I, again, you know, uh, and I also, you know, I have to say that, you know, the – Consensus in the in, within the ISSG last Thursday was that, you know, while it was you know grim uh, uh, reality on the ground, that everyone still in that around that room believed that the best way forward was this Geneva Agreement, mm -hmm. um, but clearly, it faces uh, real challenges when we continue to see the kind of behavior uh, by the regime. And again, I think it goes back to this. How do we restore some kind of credibility to the process? And we've talked about those. We continue to talk about those with Russia. If Russia wants to come back to us with serious proposals, of course, uh, we'll listen to and consider those. Now, from your point of view and, and your allies, of course, yeah. you know, there are a number of elements that need to be put in place before we get this process going. Now, on the other side, they're saying all you have to do is really basically separate the terrorists from the moderate opposition. Why is that so difficult? Why is that so undoable? I mean, you know, if, if you can, you know, if you can leverage, sure. you know, uh, your, well, your, yeah, you know, and we've okay, talked about that. It's a, it's a valid question. I mean, we, we've talked about that, and that was one of the things that we accepted coming out of Geneva, incumbent on us to exert that kind of influence to make sure that the moderate Syrian opposition clearly got that message. You're either with the moderate uh, forces who are part of the cessation of hostilities or you're with Nusra. I think what happens when you have the reality of, of Aleppo with renewed airstrikes, with renewed fighting, with a renewed government uh, regime offensive uh, on the ground that, you know, we've talked about this before, that that only drives the moderate opposition into the arms of Nusra, and it, it, only, it only stokes that extremism. Yeah, please, I'll get to you in a second. That, that the, the moderate opposition is in any way intently or by happenstance is giving uh, cover to the Nusra? I mean, are they coordinating with them? I, Some of these moderate opposition, they, maybe they don't want to separate. I mean, that, and that's ultimately, as I said, so what we, happens in this case? Yeah, I mean, well, what happens again if we get the cessation of hostilities in place for seven days, and uh, the regime uh, would ground its air forces, and we talked about that, and that was all part of the Geneva Agreement. Then, at that point, you know. Uh, you're either with the moderate opposition or you're part of Nusra. And, and if you, you know, you, you're either signed up and you've removed and disengaged or you're part of Nusra. We've talked about that. That's where really it, the, the, the way forward becomes concrete, um, which the moderate opposition would have to choose. At this point in time, we are not there. 
Please. Now, let me just, I'm sorry, just one, one last thing. I was with one of the most moderate elements of the Syrian opposition, and he's saying that it is natural for the opposition to regroup and rearm and reposition itself, so that should not be some sort of a condition placed by the Russians or the Syrians, that they should not be doing that. Do you agree with that assessment? So I, two points to make. One is, when you have the kind of intensive fighting that you have in Aleppo, when you have the constant airstrikes, the regime offensive, again, that only exacerbates this, what we've talked about, this kind of blend or mixed intermixing of, you know, the opposition is going to try to protect itself. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to drive some of those forces, not all of them, but some of them into the arms of the extremists. Uh, that's one dynamic that's a challenge here, to be frank. Um, you know, and certainly, as I said, they're, they will seek to resupply and regroup. That's also a natural occurrence. That doesn't mean that, again, if we get a ceasefire or a cessation of hostilities in place, that requires both sides, the regime and the moderate opposition, to not attack each other. Please. That you were talking about when Russia and the U.S. brokered the ceasefire deal, the second largest rebel group, which is Akhar al-Sham, came out and very directly said that they're not going to comply with the ceasefire, nor are they going to separate themselves from al-Nusra. That was that was before that. So, other than calling on the rebels to separate themselves from terrorists, which hasn't worked apparently, what has the U.S. done to make that happen? Well, again, and I'm not going to get into all the details of our diplomatic engagement with uh, various groups within the moderate Syrian opposition, but we do, trust me, remain very engaged with them. And part of that was uh, previewing with them and explaining to them aspects of and responsibilities on them within the Geneva Agreement. And that was an, uh, that was an outreach that we engaged in really slightly before we reached agreement, but then, of course, in the, in the days and week or so that followed that. And we've always, sorry, just to finish, we've always owned that. I mean, we've always said it's incumbent on us, just as it's incumbent on Russia, to exert influence on the regime also to abide by the cessation of hostilities. It's just very difficult to even get to that point where you've got uh, a seven-day, we couldn't even get there. We couldn't get seven days of reduced violence. So we couldn't get to the next stage, as I talked about with Saeed, where you've self-identified if you're a member of the moderate opposition, either you're disengaged with Nusra, or you said, I'm not going to abide by that, in which case, again, you've self-identified. Does that make sense somewhat? <laughs> well, they rejected it right away. They didn't even wait for a few days before. Uh, again, I'm not, I, I'm aware of the statement, but I'm also aware that they make a lot of statements. Uh, but, but with the understanding that, uh, you know, words are words, but actions are actions, and just as we look at the regime to show by its actions that it's serious, we look to the moderate opposition to show by its actions that it's serious about a cessation of hostilities. But what, again, I'll make the point that when you've got uh, the kind of ongoing military strikes on Aleppo, that only exacerbates what's already a complicated uh, dynamic. Some, something else. So Russia, the Russian foreign minister, said while the U.S. is hitting ISIL, it spares al-Nusra, even though it is al-Qaeda. He said the U.S. is not hitting who, who, al-Nusra. Who said this? I apologize. Uh, I didn't hear the uh, first The Russian one. foreign minister. Okay, go ahead. He said the U.S. is not hitting al-Nusra at all in Syria. Why is that? Uh, I, I'm not aware of. We're carrying out uh, 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 strikes against uh, uh, ISIL. Uh, continuously as part of the coalition. Um, where El Nusra sits somewhat uh, would uh, would determine if we would be able to strike them or be in the airspace. I mean, that's part of the deconfliction, frankly, that we've I talked about before. Where, uh, And again, to refer back to Geneva, if we can get to a point where we've grounded the Syrian regime, whether we have seven days of reduced violence, then we can set up this this joint implementation center. And the whole idea behind that was, at that point, we would work with Russia to strategically target Nusra. Now, we're far from that right now. So if this agreement fails, uh, is the U.S. not going to target oh, Al-Qaeda Oh, we're, trust Syria? me, we're going after, and we're going after Nusra in a very strategic way. We're not just indiscriminately bombing where we believe Nusra is. Uh, and also striking civilian targets as well as moderate Syrian opposition. There is a way to do this. There's a way to do this. Just let me finish. There's a way to do this 
and we've shown this by taking out senior ISIL or DASH leadership. There's a way to do this very, and I would refer you to the Pentagon to talk more detail about this, that's strategic, that's pinpointed to destroy their leadership, to destroy uh, uh, their infrastructure, but not in a haphazard or in a heavy-handed way that, that, that puts at risk civilians and, frankly, the moderates here in opposition. Nick? An al-Nusra commander, I just have one more. Sure. An al-Nusra commander told journalist Jürgen Todenhofer with the German Focus magazine that the group received weapons from the U.S., including tow anti-tank missiles. This al-Nusra commander was quoted as saying, quote, the missiles were handed over directly to us. Americans are on our side. Nusra? Quote. That's complete. I, I don't do even know. It's complete poppycock, complete. By, who, I, I, by the journalist who's quoting this commander, or by the commander? By the commander, I would assume. I, I don't. I don't want to challenge his journalistic integrity. But whatever he's saying, no, we've absolutely not provided. I can't say that as uh, vehemently enough uh, that we would never provide uh, Nusra with any kind of assistance whatsoever. We view them as a foreign terrorist organization. We view them as an affiliate of Al Qaeda, and we're going to seek their continued destruction. Please. Well, what exactly is Poppycock? <laughs> I was trying to think of a better word there, but I went for my that British. May, that may be the first time it's come up. In the <laughs> Sorry. Come up. I just wanted to ask one thing. In one of your that. responses to Arshad, yes, sir. You resurrected the legendary Plan B. I did without prompting. And you said we're not there yet. Does this thing exist, or I, is it a myth? I, no, I mean, Matt, I wrote, I, I raised that specter, uh, if you will. Um, no, because I think people are saying. You know what next, or what's what are you going to do? You, you know the the Geneva Agreement, the Geneva uh, the the implementation of the Geneva Agreement is failing. So what's next? What do you have? What are you what are you looking at? And what I wanted to make clear in my answer to Arshad was that we're looking at, and we continue to have discussions because there are other options out there, and I think we all know what yeah, those options plan, are. There's a plan B. There's, is there a plan C, too? There's not a plan B. What, we, what I wanted to no. make clear was we still consider the Geneva Agreement and implementing that and trying to push that diplomatic process uh, as the best way forward. Nick? So, Sorry. I'll get back to you. up on this. So if, if, um, if, there's, the, if there's the period of uh, reduced violence, but then the moderate opposition doesn't separate from al-Nusra, would that mean that you would no longer consider them the moderate opposition and would then bomb them? I mean, we've talked about this before. I mean, the, you know, the cessation of hostilities, um, it's incumbent on on all the parties to themselves to adhere to it. Uh, and so after a certain period, if, if, if a, an opposition group refused to again, disaffiliate or disconnect itself with uh, El Nusra, and we're going after El Nusra, then they would ipso facto or whatever. Okay, so that I'm using Latin now, probably <laughs> wrongly, incorrectly. Um, but you, know, you understand my point, yeah. is at a certain point, <laughs> at a certain point, uh, you're either with the moderate opposition or you're with Nusra. Okay, and then the second was just, do you now believe, after what you've seen in the last week or so, that Russia does not have the influence to bring uh, the up? Honestly, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's either one or the other. It's either they're, they're choosing to, uh, to continue to allow the regime to carry out military offensive or they're unable to influence them from, uh, from uh, pursuing a, a military uh, offensive. Um, as for the regime, I, I think, you know, uh, Assad has spoken to this himself. I think he still believes that there's a military solution to this uh, conflict. And, and, again, just as it's incumbent on us to persuade the moderate opposition to abide by the ceasefire and to say that there's only a political way forward, it's incumbent on Russia to say the same thing to Assad's regime or Assad's cronies uh, or his backers to say, you're not going to win this militarily. So, and then the last one is just uh, on the issue of Assad himself. I mean, the administration has sort of walked back from its uh, proclamation, I, I think, in 2011, saying, you know, he had to go. Uh, I, I, can you, would you consider a scenario now where Assad would stay on not only during a transition period, but even afterwards? Uh, what, we, what we've said, um, Nick, and, uh, just to clarify, is, you know, uh, we believe Assad can never be the legitimate leader of Syria, given what he's wrought against his own people. 
Um, but that ultimately, that's something for the Syrian people to work out through a political settlement or political negotiation process, sorry, uh, in Geneva. And what we've also said is we don't believe that if there is this political transition and democratic elections, it's our opinion that uh, Assad wouldn't be elected. Uh, and there would some, have to be some kind of transition. But I guess my point, broadly speaking, is it doesn't mean that Assad would need to go, although we'd like to see him go tomorrow or the next day, but that as part of a political transition, he could remain in power somewhat until there was a democratic election and then uh, a transitional. If there were a, a transition process and the result was after an election that he remained in power. Look, and ultimately that's a decision that. for the Syrian people. It's difficult for us to imagine that that would ever be the case, that he would be democratically elected as uh, Syria's leader. But you would be willing to see a transition whereby the end well, result was a democratic so election this is, in which he was a candidate. So this is, well, again, that's part of the, the both sides, all the parties to work out in Geneva, and I don't want to speak to that process or influence that process. What we want to see is, though, a democratic process, a democratic transition. What we've talked about before, and this is something that, you know, obviously Russia has talked to before, too, is we don't want to see a vacuum uh, created. Uh, so how that transition looks in terms of certain institutions with the, uh, of the old regime staying in place or in some measure being able to provide, you know, security, services, that kind of thing is – does make some sense. Hey, yes, please. Just, just to be clear, I think the language you used to use, one formulation of it was that Assad has lost legitimacy yes. to lead Syria, yes. right? But, what did I just say? But <laughs> President, no, it's okay. okay. But President Obama also said in August of 2011, uh, quote, for the sake of the Syrian people, the time has come for President Assad to step aside. I mean, that's, that's not just he's lost the I understand. No, I, I'm, he needs to go. I, I, I understand the, the evolution. Um, but ultimately, again, it, this is uh, – that's a, that's a step that he's not uh, chose to make, chosen to make. And that's also uh, uh, an action that the moderate opposition or the opposition has been unable to make him make. But is, is that still your view, that he, he has to go? whether it's of his own volition or, or of somebody else's? Or so it, again, or, I think that – I think what we would say that. is it's our belief it's that he's lost all legitimacy. He should not be the leader of that country. How he goes through a transition, through a political transition, that's up to the Syrian people to work out. Uh, but we still don't believe he can, he can be the legitimate leader of Syria. So I don't know if you saw the statement by Senators McCain and Graham earlier today. Um, but in it, they said, quote, diplomacy in the absence of leverage is a recipe for failure. At best, it offers the, the Obama administration a fig leaf to cover the abject failure of its Syria policy and the fact that there is no plan B. Putin and Assad will not do what we ask of them out of the goodness of their hearts or out of concern for our interests or the suffering of others. They must be compelled, and that requires power, until the United States is willing to take steps to change the conditions on the ground in Syria. The war, the terror, the refugees, and the instability will all continue." Close quote. How do you answer that criticism? Uh, well, uh, I'll answer it in a few ways. Uh, first of all, and I would refer you to uh, – it hasn't been published yet, but the uh, Secretary spoke a little bit to not that specific statement uh, from Senator McCain, but an earlier uh, statement made by Senator McCain. Um, first of all, um, if – and what the Secretary said, if Congress wants to give us other authorities or options, then Congress is able to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they do have a certain uh, leverage themselves in this process. Um, but I think – more broadly speaking, about why or how do we do this without any leverage, um, it is – first off, it behooves any, any country looking at the humanitarian catastrophe that exists today in Syria to do something to stop it, to end the fighting. 
um, and allow people to uh, live in peace. Uh, but even if you don't have those kinds of uh, uh, motives uh, in your foreign policy, it is it, there is a leverage in the fact that uh, there will be no uh, military solution to the fighting in Syria. And if we walk away from a diplomatic process, uh, and the Secretary alluded to this before in his comments, this could go from very bad to much worse. Uh, and uh, Russia is uh, in a position now where they're supporting uh, the regime, uh, and that could expose them to uh, uh, a greater involvement and more of a burden sharing. Uh, in order to prop up that regime if the fighting became worse. So, I mean, there's – I'm sorry, just to finish. So, I mean, there's a – if you're just looking at broad strategy uh, with regard to Syria, there's a logic that would compel Russia, I think, to pursue and enforce a diplomatic solution. And what if the Russians and the Iranians and Hezbollah are all willing to invest more in Syria? certainly than the United States has thus far, that they – what if they are just going to pursue a military solution? So if they continue the bombardment of Aleppo, they can then retake Aleppo. As the Secretary said, that's what they're trying to do. It's the largest – or it was the largest city in the country. What is to stop the Syrian military with its external support from prosecuting and achieving a military solution and retaking big chunks, if not most or all of the country eventually. Well, look, you I'm, don't do you know, something other than pursue a diplomatic solution. Well, look, I'm not a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a military uh, expert. Um, uh, I'm a diplomat. And so, uh, you know, I think Secretary Kerry is uh, – playing the hand he's been dealt, and that is to pursue uh, a diplomatic process to bring about a peaceful end to the conflict and a peaceful transition uh, to democracy uh, in Syria. I think that um, those who may be deluded into thinking there's a military solution also have to realize and we've alluded to this before, that there are those – and not the United States, but there are those uh, who back various uh, groups uh, and opposition groups within Syria who also uh, may seek to arm them. And again, what you have as a result is just an escalation in what is already uh, horrific uh, fighting. Uh, as I said, things could go from bad to much worse. Okay, if you're aware that, you know, the, the portion of Aleppo that is under uh, opposition control is actually the smaller portion of Aleppo. It is the larger segment of Aleppo that is under regime control or actually, you know, uh, as far as normal is concerned in that case, or can be but they're considered. But you know, again, Aleppo, I, you know, I mean, you know I, that I, goes on and so on. So it's not, yeah. it's not all of Aleppo that I is agree. being bombarded, right? Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you rule out the possibility that U.S. allies are giving weapons to al-Nusra? Uh, I'm not going to – again, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it where I left it with Arshad, which is that, you know, there are uh, countries – and we've spoken about this before – who uh, who will also seek to support and back some of the opposition um, and may uh, provide them with assistance. I mean, that's – you know – Again, that's not – I'm not speaking on behalf of the – you know, I'm not saying the U.S. is going to do this. Um, but that's sort of, that's just looking at the scenario that exists in, in Syria if this, the regime does pursue a military uh, strategy and if the uh, ISSG falls apart, then that could happen. That's a possible scenario. And that's we don't want that to happen. No, well, I'm you saying. Would ask your colleagues not to. Sorry. Yes. You would ask yes. Your, your we what like what we want to see happen. happen. You, you're asking me what's so. First off, and I'm I'm responding to a hypothetical, which is always dangerous. But what I want under what I want to make clear is the stakes, um, which is why 
in spite of the challenges, in spite of uh, the lack of progress, we continue to pursue a diplomatic uh, solution. Um, earlier in your response or non-response to the uh, statement from Senators McCain and Graham, you suggested that Congress, if it uh, so, if it deemed appropriate, could give you additional authorities and uh, uh, to act. I mean, are you saying that the administration is constrained right now from doing it, from doing more in Syria because Congress won't act? Because there was only one time that I remember specifically related to Syria that the administration was going to go to Congress, and then and that was when the red line was crossed, and then the decision was made not to. And so, so, I'm, so I'm just curious, what exactly is it, if anything, that you that you would like Congress to, to give you? I'm simply saying that, you know, if Congress has criticism of our uh, Syria policy, not at all. Oh. But they can, you know. But I mean, you say, so you're not suggesting that a lack of action by Congress no, I mean, they is, can, is they responsible can, for where we are now. Not is at that all. what you're saying? No. So if Congress has, uh, you'd finish this sentence. If yeah. Congress has criticism of your policy on Syria, they can. I mean, they're Congress. They can, you know, they can, again, push for a change in policy. Um, <laughs> that's what they are. I think they are doing that. I mean, that statement would seem to be. But it's a statement. I mean, there's other ways to do that. My point is, is that we within the interagency, and I'll go back to what I said earlier, have these discussions all the time. Uh, about different options. It's part of what that process is. Um, but we are where we are, and we remain where we are. Please. Can we change the subject? I'd love to. Right. Uh, DPRK. Sure. Do you have anything on the uh, four Chinese individuals and one Chinese companies that was uh, designated uh, regarding facilitating the money laundering for uh, on sure. behalf of a, a um, company. A little bit. Um, this was obviously uh, today, you're talking about today, the U.S. Department of Treasury added four Chinese nationals and one Chinese entity to their specially designated nationals list for evading U.S. and U.N. sanctions uh, with regard to or imposed on North Korea. Uh, and I think it was the Department of Justice that uh, actually unveiled or unsealed the criminal complaint. Uh, so I would have to refer you on for there any detailed questions to the Department of Justice. Uh, what I can say is, uh, you know, it was necessary to take these actions uh, to maintain the integrity of uh, the sanctions that were imposed by the United Nations and by the United States. And the United States and the international community uh, will not stand idly by while North Korea continues to flaunt or flout, rather, its uh, international obligations, uh, as outlined in numerous UN Security Council resolutions. Um, so, I don't know if you need anything more. Uh, one of the individual, uh, she's a chairwoman of the company, um, Hong Xiang. She was also detained last month, and her company was also investigated by the Chinese authority. Uh, do you welcome such in Chinese investigation on this, on this matter? And then could you tell us if there was any information or intelligence sharing between Washington and Beijing regarding this case? Uh, well, we regularly consult with the Chinese government uh, on a wide range of issues, uh, including these kinds of activities. Um, uh, and um, when uh, uh, when action is consistent with our obligations under UN Security Council Resolution 2270 um, and our domestic sanctions laws, we do take action. We do uh, cooperate. Um, you know, uh, we coordinate on sanctions, uh, other measures to counter North Korea's uh, development of nuclear weapons, uh, and we're going to continue, obviously, to. Uh, work with China and urge them uh, to use their leverage, and they do have leverage over North Korea uh, as their largest trading partner, uh, to fully implement all the current UN Security Council or yeah Security uh, Council sanctions. Um, all of this, obviously, the broader aim here is to convince uh, uh, Kim Jong Un uh, that really his only viable way forward is to. Um, pursue a path of denuclearization. 
So, um, you know, this shows that we can uh, work cooperatively with China. Well, we both see it as in our interest to apply greater pressure on North Korea. Do you work on such Chinese investigation on Da Lian Hongxiang, the, the company, the Chinese company, uh, DHIH? Uh, so I don't have all the details in front of me. Now. I'd probably refer you to the Department of Justice to talk about specific actions against that company. Sure. Um, this happened last week, but uh, amid all the maelstrom around UNGA in New York, where we were, uh, I don't think it's been asked about or responded. That's in Vietnam on Thursday, I believe, sentenced these two bloggers to prison. Do you have anything on that? Check. Uh, yes, uh, we're concerned uh, by the September 20 conviction of land rights advocate uh, Gun Tao, Gun T, uh, Tio, uh, apologize if I mispronounce that, under Article 245 of Vietnam's uh, Penal Code. Uh, we're also concerned by the September 22 decision by an appeals court to uphold the convictions of the bloggers uh, you mentioned, uh, Nguyen Hu Ving and uh, uh, Nguyen T. Ming Thuy, uh, also under Article 250, or rather under Article 258 of Vietnam's Penal Code, uh, the use of criminal provisions uh, by Vietnamese authorities to penalize individuals for exercising their right to freedom of expression, uh, which is provided by Vietnam's uh, Constitution and, and uh, also under Vietnam's international obligations, is, as I said, troubling. And we call on the government to release these three individuals as well as other prisoners of uh, conscience and allow all individuals in Vietnam to express their political views and assemble peacefully without fear of retribution. Do you know if that um, uh, message has been made directly to the Vietnamese or is it just in this form? Uh, so uh, uh, I can say we regularly raise these issues. I'll have to take the question whether we've raised these specific cases uh, uh, with the Vietnamese government, we raise these issues uh, regularly with Vietnam, and uh, President, Obama, President Obama did during his visit uh, in May 2016. Um, but I'll have to check on whether uh, whether he, we've raised these specific cases. My uh, guess is that we probably have. Please. Um, the Philippines, uh, President Duterte uh, today said that he was going to visit Russia and China this year to chart an independent foreign policy and to, quote, open alliances, close quote, with Russia and China. Um, he also said that the Philippines was at, quote, was at the, quote, point of no return, close quote, in its relations with the United States. Um, uh, does that concern you at all, given that the Philippines is a treaty ally? Well, look, um, so, a couple of thoughts here. One is we've also obviously seen the reports uh, regarding uh, President Duterte's statements. Um, I guess I would refer you to his office uh, uh, for, what you for any to... comments. Um, I, I think what I would say in terms of our reaction is that uh, we continue to work closely with and focus on uh, our relationship with the Philippines in the many areas of mutual interests, including counterterrorism uh, uh, and uh, including uh, working with development, economic development. Um, uh, and we continue to pursue those activities. Um, we've not been officially con contacted uh, by Philippine authorities regarding any of the things that President uh, Duterte has said um, with regard to them pursuing alliances or uh, partnerships with China and Russia. Uh, they're a sovereign nation, and uh, we're certainly not going to hold them back from pursuing closer relations with either of those countries. Um, you know, it's not a zero-sum game. We believe that we can uh, remain uh, a close friend and partner uh, with uh, the Philippines. Uh, it's one of our most enduring bilateral relationships uh, w within the Asia-Pacific uh, region. 
and it's been a cornerstone of stability for 70 years. And uh, again, we're going to keep up that cooperation until we hear otherwise. Two, two things on Please. this. One is our story um, says that he ruled out the Philippines participating in a maritime conflict uh, if it was initiated by the United States, despite the, you know, the 1951 treaty. Um, is, is that what you expect of an ally? Well, again, I haven't seen those specific comments, so it's hard for me to uh, react to them. I, I, I guess I would say, you know, arguing with the premise is that, you know, the United States has a strong security presence uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, but we're certainly not looking to start uh, military action against anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so I'm unclear about what he's referring to. And one last thing. I mean, the, the President of the Philippines has in has been reported, at least, to have sworn at the President. He has insulted your ambassador. He's questioned the U.S.-Philippine alliance, which goes back, what, 65 years. He suggested that he wouldn't come to your assistance in the military conflict if you started it. Is there nothing that he can say that will deflect you from your insistence that you're going to keep on doing business as usual with the Philippines? I did say a couple of weeks ago, especially after his remarks with, uh, uh, or alleged remarks uh, regarding uh, President Obama, that words do matter. Um, you know, we're not deaf. Uh, we, we do hear what he says. Um, and yet, I, I would just say that our cooperation with the Philippine government uh, remains strong and unabated. So we continue to engage in uh, uh, close cooperation, as I said, on a number of uh, areas of interest. And that cooperation continues. So I, I don't know what to call it, a disconnect or what, but, uh, but you know, we continue to work with the, uh, with the Filipino government. Well, are you not at all concerned that his area of interest does not appear to be, does not appear to, uh, uh, well, like, I guess my I mean, point he, is, you're, 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 no, but I guess area, my point he is, he doesn't is, seem to have the same areas of interest I, as you do. I guess my point is, is, again, he makes public statements, we've not, though seen anything with regard to our uh, relations with the Philippines that would indicate a shift, if you will, or, or a turning away. Yes. In Asia, um, do you have anything on Taiwan being boycotted from participating in the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is going to meet tomorrow in Montreal? I understand the State Department uh, supports the meaningful participation of Taiwan in uh, ICL. Right. Um, and that is, uh, so uh, we do remain committed to supporting Taiwan's uh, meaningful participation, as you put it, in the IKO. Uh, aviation safety, security, and efficiency are uh, clearly matters of global uh, importance, and all interested stakeholders uh, should and can play a positive role in ensuring that standards and regulations are met around the world. But uh, speaking to your question, in keeping with our One China policy, uh, we support Taiwan's membership in international organizations that do not require statehood. Now, in organizations that require statehood uh, for membership, such as the ICAO, uh, the United States supports Taiwan's meaningful participation. But they were being boycotted from even being participate as an observer. Do you have anything on that? Again, I just that our, that our position is that we do support their meaning their um, uh, meaningful participation. Secretary, that would uh, speak to the, our, how, where we stand on their involvement. Secretary of State was uh, required uh, to develop a strategy to help Taiwan become an observer observer for ICAO by a public law, uh, which was signed three years ago. Uh, my question for you is, uh, is there such strategy, and how do you help facilitate the meaningful participation? Well, again, I, uh, you know, uh, we work obviously closely with, uh, uh, with Taiwan and helping them to pursue this, as I said, the meaningful participation. Uh, we support their membership in all international organizations that don't require statehood. Um, but this is about our one China policy and with regards to that. Um, so, 
uh, I would just say our strategy is we want to see uh, improvement in cross-strait relationship, uh, and we want to, we've seen improvement, rather, and we want to see that continue, uh, that trend. Um, and as much as we can, we're going to continue to promote uh, Taiwan's meaningful participation in organizations such as ICAO. But I don't know, I can't give you a 10-point strategy, except that uh, we support their meaningful participation. Yes, Saeed. Uh, could I go to the Palestinian issue? Of course. And, and, and I also have a question. I'm Jordan. You know, before I get into yep, the Palestinian okay. issue. Okay, sure. uh, over the weekend, a Jordanian writer, a Christian Jordanian writer, was shot dead by an extremist uh, Muslim. Now, Jordan has been one of your allies. It has been spared this kind of violence in the past. Are you concerned that it may be headed towards a, you know, a very difficult path in, in the future? Well, uh, certainly uh, we joined the government of Jordan in condemning uh, what was a very ugly crime. Uh, we extend our condolences to uh, uh, Nahed Hadar's uh, family and his loved ones. Uh, we've seen and welcome, of course, statements by the government of Jordan uh, that this crime will be uh, fully investigated and the perpetrator or perpetrators will be brought to justice. Um, goes without saying, we condemn any kind of uh, attempt to use violence to limit or suppress uh, freedom of speech uh, or expression uh, that might differ from one's own belief. In terms of whether we see this as a, a trend, uh, I don't think we're, we can assess that at this point. Let's let the investigation play itself out and uh, see who's behind it, uh, but obviously a very tragic circumstance. Are you concerned that this, you know, killing in the name of defaming the prophet uh, is cyclical? It'd be like it happens every two, three years, I mean, you know, and so on. Said, I just don't have the analytics or uh, the background to really make that kind of assessment. Um, we do see it periodically. Um, again, any time where we see, uh, whether it's religion, b politically based or re religiously based, any kind of effort or to squelch freedom of expression, and especially in a case like this, to do so violently, uh, we condemn it. Do you, do you hold uh, your allies, whether in Saudi Arabia or in the Gulf state or in Jordan, and this land of and so on, do you hold them, you know, uh, uh, well, are they shirking their responsibilities and not coming out and speaking against this kind of thing? Look, I mean, we, this is an issue we raise, uh, you know, uh, uh, regularly with, in, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, but uh, with other countries, uh, other governments in the region. Um, well, we recognize, it's no, no, of course, the, you know, I understand. But I'm just saying energy. that, you know, while we certainly have and pursue strategic interests with, for example, uh, members of the GCC, but other countries and governments in the region, uh, that doesn't mean we don't raise uh, these kinds of issues, human rights issues, freedom of expression. Uh, and push for uh, greater democratic reforms. TJ. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. You, we, uh, I'll go ahead. Okay. No, no, go ahead. I want to ask on the Palestinian issue after you. Doesn't matter. I just I didn't realize I cut you off there. Yeah. Go ahead, TJ. We'll get to you and I'll get back to the The two subjects. First is uh, is the State Department considering putting more resources ab about the release of uh, Clinton emails before the election date? So with regard to that, and we've spoken about this before, um, we've already invested, trust me, uh, considerable resources in trying to move through uh, uh, all the FOIA and deal with and respond to all the FOIA requests uh, that we have uh, regarding uh, um, Secretary Clinton's emails. Um, and as you know well, that we were able to uh, go through the 55,000 uh, that she uh, uh, presented to us. Um, we've also said that our resources are rather stretched. We continue to work through these uh, emails, the, uh, the, those that we've received now from the FBI. Um, we're going to be as responsive as we can, as quickly as we can, but there is a process we need to conduct in order to fully vet these emails uh, through the interagency uh, to make sure if there need to be any redactions or upgrades. So that's what's driving our, our timeline. And, and I was asking because there were reports that uh, the, out of these 5,600, uh, some of them are duplicates, and uh, you, you, the department has said that uh, you can do, say, 1,000 emails by election day. So it seems there are reports that you are putting some 
resources from other, you know, diverting them into it to release more? Well, this is something, again, um, that, you know, we've got, we've been working quite hard at this, um, uh, getting through, and as I said, we, we were able to get through the 55,000, post them all publicly. Uh, obviously, some were redacted, some were uh, upgraded, uh, classification. But uh, we're working as diligently as we can. I think you're referring to the, uh, though, the, that we came out on Friday and said that um, we were able to yeah. at least conduct an initial review of these FBI. FBA. Yeah. Um, and uh, out of the, I think, 14.9 14, 14 thousand, is that right? Yes. Um, documents, uh, we've been able to establish less than half. Uh, some 5,600 were work-related uh, and we're now processing them through the FOIA uh, process. But that doesn't mean we can just simply post them or, or share them uh, through the FOIA process tomorrow or the next day. Uh, we still got to go through and, and, and uh, share them with the interagency but also evaluate them with our own people to make sure, again, that we redact where necessary or we uh, upgrade the classification where necessary. And the, sec the second subject was on the you know, uh, sure, let's finish emails and I'll get back to you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, um, there, so Politico was also reporting that there had been a court hearing today suggesting that uh, the state uh, might uh, dedicate more resources uh, to um, disclosing some of these emails prior to Election Day under uh, sort of an agreement um, mandated by the judge overseeing some of the, the vice news reporter Jason Leopold's. Uh, FOIA requests. Is that something, has your thinking changed in uh, line, uh, you know, following that? Yeah, today? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that, uh, but, uh, you know, what we've talked about before is we have already um, taken on additional personnel or shifted personnel and resources in order to uh, adequately respond to the uh, uh, incredible increase in uh, FOIA requests over the past uh, couple of years. Um, but what you're saying is that this would be in response to or by election day? Correct. Uh, I'm but not aware not, of that. I mean, not to, fully, I'll, but I'll, partially, and yeah. that there would be a shift I'll, in resources, you know, as a result well, of a discussion today, a hearing today. Yeah. I'll have to look at I mean, again, I, I, I think I'll stay where I, where I just was, which is that we're not being driven by uh, election day as uh, a deadline, but we're working to be as responsive as we can as we go through these emails. Uh, to post them uh, or to share them uh, through the FOIA process. Um, if that's changed, I'll, I'll get back to you guys. The other question is, uh, the other subject was uh, on the, you know, you saw, uh, heard last last week in the UNGA and uh, India talking about Balochistan, Pakistan talking about Kashmir, and there's a heightened tension as uh, you can see on the ground there. But so are you worried uh, or is this just words and like there won't be a, you know, what is your assessment of it? So I think, you know, um, seen the rhetoric, uh, uh, heard the rhetoric. Uh, I think our longstanding position is that we believe India and Pakistan uh, really stand to benefit from the normalization of relations between them and uh, practical cooperation between them. And we encourage both India and Pakistan to pursue and engage in direct dialogue that is aimed at reducing tensions. And is there a kind of, um, like what, what do you say about the, um, the there is a U.S.-India joint ex military exercise, you know, Yudh is going on. There's one first time in history Russians are play, uh, having a, a military exercise with Pakistan. Uh, so do you have any comments on that? that well, with the uh, insinuations that there's some kind of Tit for tat or a great game being played out here. Uh, that's not at all the case. Look, we've long said with regard to Pakistan, with regard to India, uh, with regard to the region, uh, there's no zero sum game here. We are pursuing very close relations with India. Uh, we have a deep and broad bilateral relationship and multilateral relationship, but by or work on multilateral relations issues with India. Uh, there are the world's largest democracy, and we share, uh, I think, a a very similar vision of the world, and we uh, obviously have very close trade and economic ties with India, um, and also that uh, 
extends to uh, security cooperation. Um, similarly with uh, Pakistan, we want to see Pakistan better able to respond to uh, the threat that terrorism uh, uh, poses both domestically for Pakistan, but also the fact that there are terrorist groups on Pak that seek refuge or asylum or uh, shelter in Pakistan's territory. That and just a quick uh, last one on that. That uh, there is a um, uh, petition being signed by uh, Indian Americans here to the White House asking to um, declare Pakistan a state sponsors sponsor of state, state terrorism kind of thing so do you have any comment on that well look um, you know uh, that's a very specific uh, process uh, and determination uh, that involves uh, uh, a legal process um, an assessment uh, our focus with Pakistan is, uh, to enhance their capability, as I just said, to deal with a terrorist threat on their soil. Uh, they're fighting a serious and sustained campaign against violent extremism. We do believe that they're making progress, that they're taking steps to counter terrorist violence. Um, but at the same time, we've been very clear that um, they need to target all militant groups, including those that target Pakistan's neighbors, uh, and close all safe havens. Uh, I think I'll leave it there. A couple more questions, guys. A couple, yeah. Just very quick ones. Just very quick. Please, then I'll get back to you and okay. we'll end it on Israel, I promise. Good. So Oman has uh, uh, ordered the permanent closure of a newspaper which had reported on corruption, alleged corruption, or corruption by the Omani judiciary. Uh, and witnesses at the court say that the editor-in-chief uh, and uh, another person were jailed for three years and fined for this, uh, and a third journalist was jailed for a year. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, or Concerned, you're talking about the Omani court uh, decision uh, regarding the indefinite closure of uh, Al Zaman. Yes. Yeah, uh, and also the sentencing of uh, three of its staff, including the editor in chief. Uh, we're very concerned. Uh, we have conveyed that concern. I can confirm. The ambassadors engaged uh, uh, the Omani government at a senior level to express our concern. Uh, I can also say that embassy staff attended today's hearing. Um, why are we concerned? Because we support freedom of, of expression and maintain uh, that societies are strengthened when their citizens are able to uh, voice their opinion. Do you, do you have who the ambassador? Uh, I don't have that, no. I don't have who. As I'll just say senior levels. And then one other quick Please, thing for me, if I may. Yes. Um, Iran's supreme leader uh, uh, is reported by Iranian state own media as having told former President Ahmadinejad not to run again for president. From your point of view, is this a good thing because you guys did not have the best of relations with Ahmadinejad, or is this a bad thing because um, the supreme leader shouldn't be telling people who can and can't run? Uh, I'm just not going to attempt to uh, – well, I'm not going to comment on uh, internal Iranian politics, except to say that, you know, we'd like to see uh, uh, political reform, democratic reform in Iran greater democratic reform in Iran, uh, but with regard to who should run in their next presidential campaign, I'm not going to go there. Can I yes, sir. On the Palestinian-Israeli issue, according to Haaretz, uh, the Secretary of State last Monday in a closed meeting, uh, he said that, you know, that Israel and the Palestinians are headed uh, for a binational state, and then he said, quote, uh, either we mean it and we act on it or we should shut up. He's talking about the creation of Palestinian state. My question to you is, uh, first of all, uh, what does that mean? And does it mean that maybe the Secretary of State has something uh, to offer in, in the next few months and so on? I, I, look, um, I'll, I'll let his but, remarks speak for themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, we continue to call on both sides to uh, demonstrate through actions and through uh, policies that they're genuinely committed to a two-state solution. But the remarks are available on our website. Thanks, guys.